Hi, everybody, and welcome to On the Map. This is a session about advanced mapping and spatial analysis. So if that's not what you're expecting in this room, there is no shame in standing up and walking out to get to the right session. We've all done it, OK? So today you have two of us presenting to you. You have myself and you have Rachel Bowes. Now, Rachel and I actually worked with each other for a few years before I joined Tableau. We worked in the UK for a GIS software vendor called CADCorp. Now, Rachel joined us in the QA department. That means that she used to test software to make sure it didn't have loads of bugs in before it went out to customers, something I'm sure you all appreciate. And then she moved into our customer solutions area. So she actually went out on site with our customers, installing GIS software and helping them understand their data spatially. I, however, then left, joined Tableau, and it is a really fun company to work for. Come and see me after, because I do like recruitment bonuses if you want to join us. And uh, so I picked up the phone straight away and said, Rachel, are you ready to have more fun? She was, she did, and that is why she's here with you today. Yep. So when I met Andy, he already had 15 years experience in the spatial industry in things like oil, for oil and gas companies, emergency services, and even worked for the British Antarctic Survey. So he was always a really key person for me to go to when putting together solutions for our customers. And I'm glad I did join him at Tableau because it means I can be here today with all you lovely people. And one more thing you should know about myself and Andy before we go any further. We love a good selfie. <laughs> Do we have any rugby fans in? Yeah, I thought that was a bit of a dangerous question in the US. For those who don't know, it's a bit like American football. This was taken on the pitch at Twickenham after we learned the hacker at a Tableau event. If only they could teach us how to win rugby games. <laughs> OK, so why are we here today, and why is there a big Petra uh, tool belt behind me on screen? OK, it's because what we're doing today is an advanced session, and we're pushing the boundaries of what Tableau was designed for. So in order to be able to answer all those kind of spatial questions that you may have, sometimes Tableau alone can't do it. So we want to arm you with the ability to use a wide range of different tools to complement what Tableau can do. And we're going to split that down into a few sections for you. Yep. So the agenda that we've put together today all, are all inspired by customer questions that, that have come to us. And we're going to start by looking at life inside Tableau. So we know we can connect to spatial files, but we need to know where that limit is as well. And when we reach that limit, we need to know how we can use our databases. So in Tableau, we can't yet do spatial joins or geoprocessing, but your spatial database can. So we're going to show you how you can utilize your spatial database to view your results in Tableau. So things like if you want to see if I, how many customers do I have in three miles of my store, or if I were to build this road, what boundaries is it going to cross? Who's it going to affect? Your spatial database can help with things like that. Then we're going to take a look at Python. So Python is one of the Tableau releases that I was most excited about because being able to use Tableau, a Python in Tableau, opens up a world of opportunities. As long as you can code it, you can, you can run that in Tableau. And then finally, we're going to look at your GIS. We're going to use a GIS as a prep tool. So Tableau isn't a GIS, and we're not trying to be. But you can process data in your GIS, pull it back into Tableau to answer even more questions and get a, a more enriched understanding of your business. But before we come on to any of that, we're going to take a look at projections. Now, we looked at the feedback from last year, all the sessions uh, that were advanced sessions covering mapping, and projections was one of the topics that came up quite a lot. Now, this is a topic that quite literally is the foundation of all mapping and spatial analysis. And you need to understand it quite well in order to make sure that you succeed with some of the more advanced topics that we're going to cover. So in order to help get you to understand a bit more about projections, we're going to give you a live demonstration using the whole world, quite literally. So what we're going to do now is try and get this completely spherical object onto a flat monitor or a piece of paper. So the only way we can do this is obviously by cutting it. So we're going to cut down the international dateline. Go for it. There we go. We were going to cut down the zero line on the map and see what happens if there was a physical Brexit of the UK from the rest of Europe, but we thought we'd keep politics out of that. <laughs> OK, that's good enough. So right, let's pull this apart a bit. OK, right, you can see with one cut, we're not really being very successful there. It's all wrinkled. It's not going flat at all. So the only options we now have are make thousands of small cuts. Who wants a map in a thousand small pieces? Nobody. Or we can start to cut out an area that we're interested in and stretch it. So let's cut out the North American continent. We may accidentally get a little bit of South America as well. Go for it. OK. Oh, we're also getting a bit of Greenland. You've just uh, accrued a new area. OK, right. Now, if you can stretch that out for me as best you can and try and get that flat. So what Rachel's doing now is applying a specific type of stretch, whatever she feels like, to try and make 
North America fit perfectly on a flat piece of paper and you're not doing too well at the moment. Okay? So Rachel's stretching is a projection. She is projecting that piece of curved surface onto a flat plane. She didn't do very well, but she did give it her best shot. So that's a projection. Now we have to make this a little bit more complicated. We now need to talk about coordinate reference systems. You want to be able to measure from somewhere. You want to know where you are on this projection. So I landed in Chicago and was kept there for ages waiting for my luggage. So I'm going to have Chicago being the center of misery for me. Is anybody here from Chicago? <laughs> Sorry, it's just your airport, not your city. So I'm going to draw a line all the way down through Chicago. OK? And I'm going to draw another line across through Chicago. And I'm going to call that 0, 0. I don't know if you can see that up on the screen there. OK, I've just drawn a line straight through Chicago. Now, it means that Chicago is now the most important place in all of the US to me. I'm going to measure in feet, in miles, in meters, in inches, all the way from the center of Chicago. It is the most important thing. OK, that is my coordinate reference system on top of Rachel's projection. OK, so that's a coordinate reference system and a projection. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of these. OK. So when you go downloading data from the fire department, from the police department, from Google, from local government, from all the different data sources, you can get different projections from all of them. So you need to understand which one it is in, or it's in, sorry. They'll normally come with something called an EPSG code. An EPSG code is a series of numbers that defines to a computer or any other program what the projection is and what coordinate reference system is in use by that piece of data you've downloaded. Look out for that and be aware of it. So if we look at just Nevada, where we are today, these are the most common ones in use for just Nevada. There's a lot more, but these are the most common ones, OK? So there are lots of these things that you could find. So you may download five data sets and have five completely different projections and CRS just for that area. It can leave you feeling a little bit like this, OK? That's how I feel in March, because my kids are still watching this film every single morning from Christmas onwards, and I have to take the DVD and lock it away, OK? But don't worry to start with because we have Tableau to the rescue. Yep. As promised, we're going to start our journey today in Tableau, the promised land where, where life is easy. So what we have here, we have a workbook. I have some prop property price data for London. And I can aggregate that in many different ways. So at the minute, we're looking at health boundaries. I could change it. I could say I want to aggregate this data by census area. Or I can change it again and say I want to look at it at government district level. Either way, I don't think I'll be buying a house in London anytime soon, but that's beside the point. If we look at the data source, you can see how I built this. So I have my property data in a CSV, and I have three different spatial files. I've got my health boundaries in GeoJSON, I've got my districts in a tab file, and census boundaries in a shape file. Now, from here, you can't see what projections they're in, but we can open these in a, in a notepad and see. So here, for census boundaries, we have ED50 UTM zone 30N, rolls right off the tongue. But then my health boundaries are in EPSG 4326. But Tableau is doing this on the fly and reprojecting for us. So it takes all the hard work out, all the hard work for us. So what are some key takeaways that we've learned about projections? So your data can come in all different projections and coordinate reference systems. So it's really important to look out for those EPSG codes, because they'll tell you what it's in. And Tableau just makes this stuff work for you. So if this was the case, why did we bother telling you? Why did we bother spending the last 10 minutes telling you about projections if Tableau just does it all for you? Well, it's all, life's all great in Tableau, but the other tools that we're going to show you now, they don't do that for you. And if, they, if your two data sets that you're processing aren't in the same projection or coordinate reference system, things just won't work. Thanks, Rachel. So now we're going to have a look at life inside your database. OK? You are not in Kansas anymore. OK? Anybody here from Kansas? Oh, no. OK, the magical place of Tableau where all of these things just work. OK, you can bring your data in in any projection, and it just reprojects on the fly, and you can just start using it together. That is not the case in a spatial database. You have two different tables, two different projections. OK, you'll either get a result, and you're like, what the heck does this mean? You just won't understand it. Or it will just silently fail. It won't bring up a nice error message saying, warning, these are in different projections. It just silently fails. So you have to be aware of these kinds of things before we go and use our databases. So why are we bothering to use a spatial database? What is it that a spatial database can do that you can't do with a regular database? 
Well, there's lots and lots of things we don't have time to talk about, but the main thing is just joining tables together. If we have a look at the dialog inside of Tableau as of today, okay, I'm joining one table to another table where column A equals column B, or if it gets a bit more complex where one value is more than another, less than another, get the idea. We're joining based on those two columns. Now, in a spatial database, we're joining based on the objects in those two tables and their relationship in three-dimensional space. Okay, and there are lots of different types of relationships. It's not just an equals. There are lots of different types of relationships you can use to define how you're going to join these different tables together. So since we need to talk about relationships, let's give you a little bit of relationship counseling, purely on the database side. Okay? Now, this is one of the topics that was most common before the hurricanes came across the Atlantic and slammed into the US, but it's been brought into focus an awful lot more. People have been asking us, have I got clients that are in an evacuation zone? Do I have people in a flood zone? Uh, where, where are all of our assets? We need to be able to make sure that we get these out in time because we have a natural disaster on its way. So we say the relationship of this property to this flood zone, which you can quite clearly see, it intersects the flood zone. The property intersects the flood zone. Now, this intersect relationship is the 90% of relationships you're going to use. Like, it covers most of the use cases that people want to know about. Does any part of object A intersect any part of object B? If so, true, we've got a match and we can join it. But just like in life, where you need to define properly the boundaries of your relationship to be more successful, things get a lot more complicated. There are other types of relationship you might want to use inside of your database as well. I'm not going to cover them all, but the most common include this one. So here I have the land, and I have the sea, and there is a cliff. Now, at no point does the sea ever go into the land space. The land doesn't go over. They're sharing this common boundary, OK? They're, they're, they're respecting each other's space, OK? It's touching. It's a touches relationship. So that's another type of relationship to join your table as opposed to intersect. Another one, I have a highway here and I have a county boundary. The highway crosses the county boundary. You may have all of your delivery routes, but you want to specifically look for those that cross an international boundary rather than county boundaries. Where it crosses an international boundary, I need to check, do my drivers have the right permits? Am I carrying the right type of items for those customers? So I'm looking for a crosses relationship. And finally, if we look here at the Mandalay Bay, there are lots of uh, different swimming pools. If you want to be able to check them all out, if you swim in one, you can't swim to all the others. You have to physically get out of the pool and walk to the others. Real hardship, I know. But that means that there is no relationship. They are disjoint from each other. So that is a type of relationship you might want to use. But we could also say they are within distance of each other. So one pool is within 50 meters of another pool. Or it might be, I'm looking for all clients that are within 100 miles of the nearest hospital or all of those that are disjoint and further than 100 miles from the hospital. So that's another type of relationship we could use. Yep. So now we've all had our relationship counseling, let's look at a, a real world implementation of that. So behind me, you can see a stormy Las Vegas strip. And what we're going to talk about first is flooding. So Andy's already touched on it. There may be some people affected in this room by the recent floods, or you'll at least know someone that is affected. And even just the day before the Hurricane Irma hit the US, I was, on, I was speaking to a colleague who was speaking to a customer looking at evacuation zones in Florida. So in situations like this, in crisis like this, it's important to be able to utilize all the tools at your disposal to be able to get the answers you need. So we're going to be looking at what is safe in a Vegas storm. So I'm staying in Vegas for a few days after conference, and I started looking at Airbnb data. So I thought that would be a good thing to use here. And then I also went online to the state of Nevada and downloaded the 100-year flood zones. So I want to know, are any of these Airbnb properties within or are they intersected by this flood zone? OK, so here I have all my properties in Tableau. And it's important to know I haven't connected to a flat spatial file here. I'm just plotting the latitude and the longitude. So what I've done here, I've connected to a Postgres database. And in there, there's spatial tables. Now, I'm using Postgres, but Oracle, SQL Server all have spatial capabilities in them as well. And you can see that when I connect to my data source, it's just a table that I've brought in with the latitude and longitude values. Now, in that database, I also have a separate spatial file, my flood, zone, my flood zones. And I want to write some custom SQL to do this join. Now, some people shy away a little bit when it comes to writing custom SQL, but Tableau can actually help you here too. So if I go up to data, and convert this to custom SQL. What we get, Tableau generates for you. So if I want to write custom SQL to pull in all the data that we do with the drag and drop, this is the SQL that I need. 
So we can see I'm looking at my properties table, and then I'm pulling in all these different attributes from there. So that's the first half done for me. And now there is a little bit of knowledge required in able to do the next step, which is doing the join. But I've done it for us here already. So if we check out this custom SQL, what you can see here, the first, the top half looks the same. So we're selecting all those points and all the attributes that we want. And then the very last file, the last line, is we're connecting to our new flood zone. And we're pulling that in as well. So now we've got all the ingredients we need to bake our cake. We just need to give it the recipe. So we want to say, from my properties table, I want you to join that to my flood zones. And going back to Andy's relationship counseling, we want to use the intersect operation. What this enables us to do, if we go back here, you can now see that I have a flood zone attribute to my data. So it brings all the data set, all the data in that I need, and I can just drop that onto my view. And now we get an idea of the distribution of the, the points that are in a flood zone. And we can even look at other data in here as well. So I could say if I stay in a, a high risk flood zone, so the, the scale from one to five, five is high risk, one is low risk. So I can say it's still going to cost me around two, $200 to stay in a high risk flood zone. And if I want to be super safe, I stay in a zone two, it's actually going to cost me more. So I think on reflection, I'll probably just stay at the Bellagio after all. Big spender. <laughs> So what have we learned from our databases and our, our custom SQL? Well, it allows us to do this join based on a spatial relationship. We can say, how do these two disparate spatial files share, share a 3D space? But this is an advanced session, so I'm sure you all know, when we use custom SQL, it gets run every time on every viz. So often, we have to extract that data to help performance. But it is very easy to integrate your custom SQL, and Tableau can even help you along the way by writing that first little bit for you. So before we move on, Rachel's just said an important point there. Because of the performance impact that custom SQL has, okay, we recommend that you extract this kind of um, connection. Now, that's fine if you're talking about properties. Okay? You might acquire a new house or a new client every night, and you don't mind if it runs overnight or maybe twice during the day. Okay? But what about if your assets are moving? Okay, and what about if they move a lot? So by that, let's take the example of a gas tanker that's down, going down the highway. I don't want to find out tomorrow morning that it deviated from the intended route and someone siphoned gas off it. I want to know right now. When we told you that Vizin Tooltip is coming and Hyper is available to download in the beta right now, you all started clapping, OK? Nobody got, nobody got upset. OK, but if you take a football game in the UK, we get quite rowdy. We need to ensure that we have the right number of police inside our venue at any one time. If too many police officers walk outside the venue, I need to know now so that I can send more back in. Okay, I need to know now. In the industry, we call this geofencing. It's just a fancy word made up that just says, I want to know where my stuff is, and if it's not in the right place, tell me about it. Okay. Has anybody seen this film with Tom Hanks? Anyone seen this? Okay. Excellent, so a few of you have. It's based on a true story. He was the captain of a container ship, and he got taken over by pirates. Now, a lot of people believe that most of our goods and services we use today are actually flown in, okay? but they're not. Most of the world's cargo is still delivered by ships. This is a snapshot from marinetraffic.com of all the container ships and tanker ships out in the sea at any given time. If you go there today, I promise you it'll still look just like that. Okay? There's an awful lot of traffic out at sea. So we had a client come to us and genuinely needed to be able to identify at any given time, am I at risk of pirates? Okay? Real use case, not telling you who the client was. So let me show you how we solved that. And I will go to, there we go. So I've connected to uh, Postgres. And in Postgres, I have a table that contains all of my ship locations with latitude and longitude. It's not a spatial table, but it just has all of my customer locations. So I can put them on the map by double-clicking latitude and longitude. I'm going to use the ship's ID as the level of detail. So I now have a point on my map for every ship. Now, I need to use the same spatial relationship that Rachel used before. I want to intersect with another table that I downloaded from the internet that contains high-risk piracy areas and I put into my Postgres database. But I don't want to use custom SQL. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to use raw SQL. Now, the reason, if I zoom in here, the reason I'm using raw SQL is that raw SQL is used only when you want to use it. 
So you could have 20 other sheets. That's not best practice anyway, but you could have 20 other sheets on your dashboard, okay? And it's only going to be executed for this one. All of the other sheets don't need to run this really expensive spatial intersect operation in order to generate your bar chart about sales and profit. Okay, it's only used when you get to this one sheet. So what am I doing here? I'm using the exact same relationship called ST intersects. And I'm intersecting the points file that I've got open already with another table in my data set called piracy areas. Now, I've also included something else on here. Because my table wasn't spatial, like so in the real world, not many people do have their clients in a spatial table. It's still just got latitude and longitude. I've actually made it spatial as part of the SQL. This statement here says, make a spatial object, ST make point, make a spatial object using percent one and two, which is the latitude and longitude that Tableau is now going to pass back to my database. And I've got my projection here as well. So make sure you know the projection of your data set so that you choose the right one to pass back. Now, of note, if you're going to try this at home with your own data, you do have to use an LOD calculation to fix the level of detail, to fix the latitude and longitude to each ship. OK, so just one thing to watch out for. So even though my visualization is already at the level of ship, I need an LOD calculation to make sure it runs properly on my database. So you'll be able to download these workbooks and, and copy what we've done later. If I now drag the piracy risk out onto color, I can find out where I've got ships in a high-risk piracy area. Now, this is actually a bit more expensive than the query that, that Rachel used earlier, purely because it's got an LOD in there as well. But how our client wanted to use it was perfect for that. So if I have a look at a dashboard, so as an insurance company, I have a portfolio that looks after a certain number of ships. So if I could say, OK, let's have a look. What's Rachel up to? OK, so Rachel has one ship in a high-risk piracy area called the Hermes. OK? And she's got one that's in a medium area. And she's got a few others that we don't have to worry about. And she's covered for that. She's covered to have one ship at any one time in a high-risk area. If we go and have a look at Andy, so if we now go and have a look at what I've got. So I've got one ship in a high-risk area, but I've got three that are very close by in a medium-risk area. Now, I know I'm only insured to have any one of my fleet in a high-risk area any one time. The second that things go a little bit south, I want to be notified of that straight away because I'm not insured. So I'm going to say I'm interested in looking at high-risk areas. So I'm going to keep those only. And now what I'm going to do is set up an alert. So first I'm going to say this is uh, presentation one. Save my view. That's going to be my alert view. And now I can set an alert on this. It's just saving the view for me on server. Set an alert, and I say, Right, for this particular insurance policy, I'm only allowed one in there. So as soon as two ships go in there, alert me. I'll just send this to Rachel. Rachel at tableau.com. And I've now created my alert. So let's go back to our presentation. So that was a real world use case for, for a client, as I said. That, that method. It used the exact same spatial join that Rachel showed you earlier. It was an intersection of ships inside a piracy area. It's very efficient on subsets of your data. So not when you're looking at the whole data set, but when you need to know instantly about a small subset of your data. Is it deviating from where it's supposed to be? And it's really appropriate for using in that kind of alerting scenario. I need to know right away. I need to know as soon as that happens, please send me an alert that something is not where it's supposed to be. OK. So we're going to move on now to look at. Python. So we've looked at using custom SQL, um, raw SQL. Now it's time to add another tool to your tool belt. We're going to start talking about Python. So what is Python? Python's been around since 1991, invented by a guy called Gurdjieff Van Rossum. Does anyone know what he named the language after? No? So he actually named it after Monty Python, which, if you don't know, it's a, a cheeky British comedy from back in the 70s. But the great thing about Python is it's free and it's open source to use. And it's a scripting language that has lots of different spatial libraries you can use, but other libraries as well. So how do we use that in Tableau? Well, we use something called TabPy. So on GitHub, there's a, a TabPy project. And in there, you can download TabPy Server, which is just a, a Python process with some built-in libraries for you to utilize. And then we connect to that from Tableau Desktop through the external services. And again, this is something that's open source and free, but it's owned by Tableau. So we have a bit more control over it, and we can push updates to it much more easily. 
So how does this work? How do we get this into Tableau? Well, the first thing that you're going to see me do, we're going to create a calculated field. In that calculated field, we write our Python script. Then this script gets sent out to the Python server, where the query is actually run in the Python server. And then it's just the result is returned to Tableau in a table calculation. And doing it this way, the way in which you compute your table calculation can actually control how the data is passed to Python to be evaluated. And we won't go into that in too much detail, but we are running Python hands-on sessions as well during the conference. So come check that out. And for a, a use case for this, we've looked at flooding. We've talked about pesky pirates. Now we're going to lighten the mood a little bit and talk about fast food. So as I said at the beginning, I've known Andy for quite some time. And if there's anything I know about Andy is that he loves the McDonald's. I do love my quarter pounder meal. Yeah, anytime he goes away, he needs to know where his nearest McDonald's is. McDonald's is. So when we came to Vegas, I saw an opportunity. I saw the opportunity to introduce him to a more superior burger. But you won't believe me, he'd never heard of it. And we still haven't been yet, actually. After the session. Yeah, maybe after today. So he'd never heard of it. So I started playing around in, and thinking how I could use this in, in Tableau. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see, where is my nearest burger? We're going to use Python. We're going to call out to Google's API. First, we're going to geocode where, where our start point is. And then we're going to use another API to look at drive time analysis to see how long it'll take us to drive to one of these locations. Now, this is a bit of a lighthearted example, but it's something that we hear customers asking for over and over again to be able to put drive time into their, into their dashboards. OK, so first we need to say where we're coming from. Here we're starting at the Luxor. But we could start from anywhere. Maybe we go over back over to London. And we can geocode. This is my actual postcode back in London. But what Tableau is going to do, it's going to take that plain text, call out to the API, just passing that value in, and we go to London. And we can put anything in here we like. And Google's going to do its best to geocode for us. So maybe we could go to Mount Everest. We can check out what's going on in Nepal. And Tableau will update for us as well. No in and out burgers near there, though. No. Unfortunately. Well, I've never been, so I don't know. But I would assume not. But we're all at the Mandalay Bay today, so let's start from there. So you can see how easy it is to put in a parameter like this, allow your end user to, to utilize this, even though they don't necessarily need to understand API calls or Python integration, but you can allow them to, to interact in this way. So let's have a look at the code on how we do that. So I actually have two separate calculations here, one looking at the latitude and one for the longitude. That's what I want to pull back from my, my geocoding. And I can show you the calculation on how we do that. So the first thing we need to say when we're using Python in Tableau, we just define what is the result that we expect. So we have to call what script type we're expecting back. And then the next bit, the gray text, Tableau doesn't really care what's going on in there, because that just gets sent to Python for Python to evaluate. And you can see what we're doing here. We're calling out to the, the Google API, the geocoding API. We pass in some parameters, one of them being our address, which is argument one. And then this is what's actually coming from our data. So the parameter that you saw me typing in was called enter an address. So this is how we pass that variable into our calculation. So that's the first half of our analysis done. Now we need to know how do we get to all these in and out burgers. So I have the, the different ones from Vegas on my map here. And then I have another calculation. So this time again, you can see we're defining what are we expecting back from Python. And then we have our code. This time, calling out to a different API. This one's called Distance Matrix API. Then the next bit, this looks a bit complicated, but I'm basically just saying I want to print some values so I can show you guys what's actually happening in the Python script. And then we return a value, which is going to be how long does it take me to, to drive from my parameter address to the address of each of the in and out burgers. So we put that onto our map. And why that's running, I can actually show you. So I have TabPy running in something called Docker, which is just like a, a container that's hosting my TabPy server. And we can see the code evaluating now as it's running through. And I can't zoom in on this too closely, but you can see here, this is the, the API call that we're making. 
and you can even see the, the addresses that it's passing through as well. If we go back to Tableau now, we can see it's just about done, and we can see we can get a burger in just over 10 minutes, so if anyone's interested after today's session, I can get the Ubers on, on hold. So what did we learn from TabPy? What are our takeaways? It really does open up a world of opportunities because the way in which the code is held in that calculated field, you can have one person in the organization who knows what they're doing, write that, and then that becomes part of your data source. If you publish that data source up to server, everyone in your organization can use it, and I think it's a really beautiful way of democratizing data science. It does require a little bit of programming to do, or the ability to know what you're looking for and copy and paste from the internet. And again, it's like a beautiful way to democratize data science. And this is available on Tableau Desktop and Tableau Server. Over to Andy. OK, so our last section today is about using your GIS. Now, a GIS was designed to do one job and one job only. It's designed to perform spatial analysis, OK? And it does it really, really well. What it doesn't do, however, is let you take those results and share them back with the rest of your organization in the context of all of the other business data that you have. So you have tons and tons of other tables. You have tons and tons of other data from different data sources that is not spatial in any way. And trying to be able to bring those two together in a GIS is very, very difficult. However, you already have a tool that's designed specifically for that task. It's called Tableau. So what we should really be doing is taking the best of GIS and taking the best of Tableau and bringing them together, using them together to get the result for your end users. Now, the example that I'm going to give today is one that I've been asked about by a lot of clients in the past and by people here at Tableau. So this is something that Tableau doesn't do out of the box at the moment, but if you bring the two tools together, you can get the result that you need. So I'm going to ask a question about property. Okay, where's hot in San Francisco? So I've dealt with lots of property companies, and they want to be able to look at their data. They want to be able to analyze where those sales have been happening, where are the really expensive areas, where are the cheap areas, where should I be investing in my portfolio, and where should I be disposing of properties if I've got too many? Okay? And it's not just about knowing straight away um, in the center of your data set. If I ask you for your home city, where's the most expensive area, or where's the most crime, you can just tell me, oh, it's downtown. Okay? You, don't, you don't need to know, you don't need a GIS to tell you that. It's already there, it's defined. It's about looking for the story in the rest of your data. So that's what we're gonna try and do now with a GIS. So the Tableau option, the options that you've got out of the box now, it would involve things like taking a line, and just an imaginary line, drawing it on the world. OK, so you've got your polygons, and you color one side blue, and you color one side red. OK, now having those kind of maps might be good if you look out at the whole country. So you've got a broad, broad overview, and you've just got the polygon mapping. But in the real world, other than census data, that doesn't make sense. I mean, for a census count, somebody actually walks and takes a survey for those houses right up until they get to a line, then they stop doing the survey anymore, okay? So when you're take, making those kind of maps using census data makes sense. But when you're talking about things like properties or crime, it doesn't make sense anymore. You don't buy a house because you go to this invisible boundary that's your census line and then go, right, now I'm gonna start looking for a house. You look for a house because it has an absolutely amazing kitchen. Okay, well, that's, that's what my wife looks to look for. Okay, um, let's take crime as an example. Your TV didn't get stolen because a thief was driving around, got to that census boundary, stopped, got out of his car, and then started looking around for houses. No, your front door was open. He just happened to walk in. Real life gets very fuzzy. It doesn't live by defined boundaries. So in those instances, you re need a real heat map, and that's what I'm gonna use a GIS for now, to create a heat map and bring it back into Tableau. Now, I'm gonna use an open source GIS called QGIS now, where have I got QGIS? Let me just find it. There we go. So as I said, I'm inside of an open source GIS called QGIS. You could use uh, other GIS if you've already got some inside your organization. Now, I said I'm looking at San Francisco, and I'm gonna show you now how to build a hotspot map inside of QGIS. Now, I'm gonna cover these steps so you understand what the different types of hotspot maps are and what you can do with them, okay? I'm not gonna go through all of the steps needed to get back to Tableau, so I'll talk about that for you in a second. But first, I'm just gonna connect to my data I'm gonna say I want to add a layer, and it comes from a text delimited layer, so I have a CSV file. I'm gonna bring in my CSV file. So these are Airbnb listings. I couldn't share any real property sales data with you. So I'm just going to take some here. Press okay. It's now asking me, 
that data with latitude and longitude, what coordinate reference system is that in? 99.99% of the time, it's going to be something called WGS84. OK, EPSG code is 4326. If you see latitude and longitude, unless you're dealing directly with data from a GIS department at local state government, this is probably going to be the one. OK, so if you see latitude, longitude, just click that one. So it's now brought all of my points in. And what I want to do now is create a heat map. Now, a heat map is a raster object. That means it's just made up of pixels, exactly the same as when you take a photo with your iPhone that saves it as a JPEG. I'm going to create a picture, which is my heat map. So I'm going to click on heat map. And I now need to fill in some options. So I'm going to give it a place to save this first. And I'll call this uh, heat2. OK. Now, if I just zoom in so you can see this, it's asking me to define a radius, so a radius of 500. So if you take a classic Venn diagram, you've got those three circles, the kind that you would have seen from any salesman ever, where their product is the one that's in the middle. It does all three things, OK? Where you have those three circles overlapping, they're the three 500-meter circles drawn around your properties that you've been selling. So in the middle, it's been influenced by three properties. That's what that radius is telling us. If I press OK, and it now goes away and creates a heat map for me, what it's doing is just drawing around all of those thousands of points, those circles, and then adding them up to create a map for me. So this is a standard heat map. Now, the white areas are really hot. The black areas are really cool. Okay? I'm not going to spend time changing the color shades. But what we've actually visualized here is just density. This is just showing me where I've sold more properties. It's telling me nothing about uh, the, no the population that lived there, about how much they were sold for. So what we need to do is really weight it using some other attributes from our data. So I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to create a heat map, a raster heat map. I'm going to give it an output. Heat four. And now I'm going to click on advanced. So I'm just going to change some options here. And then I'll zoom in so that you can see them. OK, so now I'm saying I want to use a field to weight my data. And I'm going to weight it by the price that this house sold for, or in this case, the price of the Airbnb rental. OK? So those three circles, if you've still got the classic Venn diagram in your head, each one of those circles, instead of having a value of one, so where the overlap is, it's three, you've actually got the value of all those properties. So even though no house was ever sold in the middle, there was three properties around it, it, was, it would be influenced. It would have the heat from all of those three. So if I now press OK, it's going to create a different map. It's going to create a map that's weighted by the prices of those properties so I can compare areas in a high-intensity area and out in the suburbs. So if I just turn those on and off, so I'm getting a very different picture here. Oh, I forgot to tick one of the boxes. So I've got all black. But the, the heat maps do look different. Now, because there are lots of steps, and you could forget some of these, OK, what I've done for you is as long as you have your starting input points, I've created a model that you just have to double click on at the side. So if I just zoom in, I've made a model that will be able, you'll be able to download with the workbook it comes in a folder called TC Vegas, and it's called Heat Map with Join Key. And what that does is it opens up a little dialog box, and it says, please put an input layer. That will be your properties, your clients, whatever it is you want to do. Choose a field to weight this by, and then tell us where to save it. Okay? And it will run through all the steps. Because on that heat map, what it's going to do, if you just want the background to what that will actually do, it's going to draw contour lines as if you were going out hiking. You've got contour lines on a map. But these contour lines will be about heat the heat from your, from your business areas. And it's going to convert those into polygons. It's going to do joins back to your data. And it's going to give you an output. Okay, so there's lots of things that it's going to do. There are instructions that I've written as well to follow this and accompany this so that you can follow this when you get home. So if I now switch to Tableau, there we go, and have a look at what you get. So I'll connect to the output for you. So the output is a spatial file. So I'm going to click Spatial File. And I'm going to open up the heat map spatial file. But you get three outputs, the heat map, the join key that joins the spatial file back to your original properties. And you'll also get the properties converted into a spatial file as well. I'm going to connect to my heat map. It's going to open up that shape file now. And it only has two columns. So the two columns are the geometry. So this is the actual shape of the heat map itself. And it contains the level of heat as well for each of those shapes. So what I can do now quickly is I can just say, I want to create my heat map. So I double click on geometry. You can see the kind of shape it's bringing up. I'm bringing in the only other field, which is related to the level of heat. I'm going to treat this as continuous. 
I'm going to change how it looks. No border, please. I'm going to edit the colors a bit. And I'm going to spin this around. OK, and I'm going to give us a different background map just to make this look extra pretty. Everyone likes pretty maps. OK, there we go. Now, the thing here is we have something that looks pretty, but what's it actually showing me? It's not really showing me anything you probably didn't know. Again, I asked you earlier, if, if I wanted to know in your home city where is the most crime or where is the, the highest property prices, you already know this. OK, it's just highlighting here downtown. You probably, if you already know about San Francisco, anyone here from San Francisco? Yeah, we've got a few. You could probably tell me that without actually doing any analysis, OK? And the standard color palette that Tableau has applied has skewed. So I've got so many results up in that area, OK? I've got such a high range of values that all of the rest of my map is blue. And most of my visual bandwidth is being wasted in a very small area of space, OK? So I'm wasting the ability for my brain to do the visual analysis with this standard color palette. So what I've done is I've created my own. So don't be afraid to create your own custom color palettes. So this is one that I used to use uh, regularly with uh, police and insurance who wanted to do uh, insurance accumulations mapping. So in the first 50% of the range, if I zoom in on that color palette now, OK, the first 50% of the range of values that I have, it's actually going through a full color spectrum. That would normally be the whole heat map. That, that would be your final output. And you go, yes, well done. But I'm now applying that just to the first 50%. The 50% after that, I've actually inserted lots of other colors. Now, this would be hideous best practice if you were using this with anything else in Tableau. You could have the same colors repeating, and you'd be like, well, hang on, blue here? What does blue here mean if it's blue over here as well? It, it would not work. But with a continuous color heat map, it will work. So what I'm doing is I'm forcing Tableau to use more colors in that area where I have a, a, a higher range of change in values. So if I just apply that now, what that means, if I zoom in, it means I can now tell more of a story. So I can see straight away, in, that, in the hottest area, I actually have two distinct hotspots. It's not just one big mass of red. I have two distinct hotspots. As soon as we come away from that area, I now have other areas. And I can see how, how they have their own individual hotspots. They're not as hot as the middle of town. But for that area, it's still quite hot compared to what's around it. I've now got more visual bandwidth available in order to be able to make those kind of decisions. If I now put that into a dashboard, for those of you wondering, I can put the points and the polygons on top of each other. That's a question that we often get, but it's less helpful here. What I can do now is I can say, OK, well, I want to find all properties that are in, let's say, a similar level of heat. OK, so we're talking about the property heat now. OK, so we're taking across all areas, the whole the whole map, it doesn't matter where it is. It's not about this one specific geographical area. It's about the areas that have the same level of heat. So for all properties that are in and under the same kind of pressure from houses being sold, which of those, which I can now see on my right-hand side, are the ones that are the cheapest and the ones that are most expensive? So I'm now finding outliers. So I'm, these may be properties that I want to get rid of if it's my own portfolio. They may be ones that I I'm looking to accumulate if they're ones that have come on the market because they are cheaper or more expensive than all of the others in that particular area. It also enables me to compare somewhere in the suburbs that is becoming pricey to somewhere that's right in the center of town. And I couldn't normally make that kind of comparison because they're geographically disparate. But now I'm using a different technique to join my data set with a spatial data set to try and make that analysis. OK. So if I switch back to our presentation. What have we just shown there? What have I shown you? I've shown you that we can use GIS as a data prep tool. OK? Don't be frightened of using a GIS and combining the best of the GIS with what you have inside a Tableau. Tableau itself can't do these kind of things yet, maybe one day. But right now, you need to use both tools together to get this kind of analysis. Those heat maps that I showed you, they show spatial trends very well. And once you've made that heat map, don't waste your visual bandwidth with a standard palette. Use a palette that's applicable to the type of data that you're working with. The one that I've just showed you here is available to download. So remember to use your own custom color palettes to help, you, help your clients understand what data you're showing them. OK, so what did we just learn today? So Tableau can help you understand different complex spatial problems, but it can't always do the solving part for you. 
So we looked at a few different challenges today, and for each challenge, there was a tool that was best suited to get the right result. So often, Tableau is just the start, but if you expand your tool belt, you can utilize those alongside Tableau to get a more enriched understanding of your business and answer more complex questions. Now, we have enough time for a few questions, a few live questions, if anybody wants to ask before we wrap up. Does anybody have any questions? You can either shout out. I think there's a few microphones in the room if you want to use those so everyone can hear. Yeah, we have two microphones here, so if you want to. Uh, I have a general question about uh, spatial database. And one of, one of the most popular spatial database is Esri's uh, spatial data engine. Can I extract a polygon or any uh, geometry directly from SDE? So SDE is different. SDE is a technology that sits on top of a database of your choice. So if, you're, if you've been an Esri customer for a long time, that's probably likely to be Oracle. Is that yeah, right? Uh, I use uh, uh, SQL. OK, you use SQL. So when SDE is their spatial data engine, OK, but there are two different formats. There's SDO and SDE, OK? So as long as it's being stored as a native geometry object in that database, you'll be able to pull it out and use it. If it's encoded in their own proprietary way, we won't be able to access that, OK? We're literally just passing SQL back to the database itself. Does that answer your question? OK, thank you. Anyone else? The Google API, is that free to the public, or is that something you kind of have to work out with them? Yeah, it is free to the public up to a point. So for the geocoding, it blocks you out after so many tries. But you, can, you get a f number of free tokens when you first start. So that's what I did for today. So it didn't cancel out in front of a, a room full of people. So it gives yeah. you like X number of records. Yeah, yeah. it gives you a, a few tries or like a few times to geocode. And then beyond that, you have to have to pay. Thank you. Is it 1,000? I uh, believe it's 1,000. <laughs> the, the thing I get asked for the most is how to get my current location. Is there some way to do that now with the Python plugin instead of entering the location like in your example? So just to rephrase, what you're looking for is ideally some kind of parameter or something inside of Tableau that will pick up your location and pass that out to something else? Right. Is that like right? If you're, if you're in the field, if you're a sales rep in the field, he doesn't want to take the time to type in his address. He, he has it on his phone. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I feel like with Python, it would be possible, but I don't know how, yep. how you would go about that. I'd also like you to come and chat to our head of uh, development for mapping, Kent Martin, later, and just suggest that to him. A few of us have asked for the same thing. Customers, if you ask for things, we take more notice than if we ask for things. I had a question. If you have a, um, a polygon inside of Tableau, and then you overlay on top of it a bunch of points, is there a way to determine if those points are inside or outside of that polygon? Currently, you can't do that inside a Tableau. You need to use the database to make that decision for you. OK. So if anybody wants to ask us questions without standing up in front of a microphone, we'll be outside after this session. What I'd really like you to do is go home, download these workbooks and our files, and try and look like a hero like everyone else does by copying and pasting all of the code, all of the SQL examples that we've got with your own business data so that your manager thinks that you look great. OK? I promise I will try and upload them by the end of this week so that they're there for everybody. So if anyone has any colleagues that wanted to come and it was conflicting with another session, we are repeating this session on Thursday. And also, we have some similar sessions, related sessions here, if you're interested in, in learning more about them. But Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed.